The theme of the camp this year is Christianity, a misrepresented religion. And uh, I guess uh, if, if you were to be asked, well, wh what's misrepresented in Christianity? You would have a number of different answers. Uh, but I think the most fundamental and most commonly misunderstood thing in Christianity actually has to do with the identity of God, who God is. This is really the foundation of Christianity. Who is it that you worship? And what is the view that you have of the God that you worship? And so today I wanted to explore this aspect in looking at the most commonly held Christian view about God, which is the Trinity. And we want to look at it uh, as far as what Jesus has to say about it. So this is entitled The Trinity According to Jesus. And of course, I think uh, it goes without saying that Christianity is all about Christ and the teachings of Christ and following Christ's example and believing and preaching those things that Jesus taught and preached. That's what Christianity uh, really is all about. It is not just uh, trying to imitate him, but to live his life. That's really what, what it's all about. And so the reason for that is uh, Christ is the most qualified person that knows about God. He's the only being that actually came from heaven to reveal God and to tell us uh, about God. Uh, this is revealed in a number of scriptures. Matthew eleven twenty seven 27 is, is a clear one uh, that says, All things, Jesus speaking, uh, all things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. And so this is a very interesting verse in that, uh, there's only one being in the whole universe that really knows what the Father is like. Isn't that right? There's no one else. It's only Christ. And it's Christ's purpose and mission to actually reveal Him and make Him known. He, that's his whole point of coming from uh, heaven to earth, was to reveal God clearly. Sin had caused humanity to have a mis- apprehension of God, a misconception of God and of his character. So Christ's mission was to come and to reveal him. And so this is why we find that God's, uh, when God communicates with man, his clearest revelation is actually through his son. Hebrews tells us that. Hebrews uh, 1 verses 1 and 2 says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Interesting here how the apostle in writing this makes a contrast in God's means of communication. He says at one point, through different ways and means, God spoke to the prophets. But in these last days, he spoke through his son. Which of the two is the clearer way to speak? Obviously it's through the Son, because it's the Son who knows the Father best. That's why He came from heaven to earth. It gives us a little bit of, a, of an appreciation and an insight in that what we have contained for us in the New Testament is a much clearer revelation that God is communicating than what we have available in the Old Testament. Now, God is the one who is revealing and, and manifesting both. There's no question about that. But when the Son came, that opened a whole new chapter. It brought us to a whole new level. That's what the apostle here is emphasizing. So this is why we want to look at this topic through the eyes of Jesus or through the things that Jesus came and spoke. Jesus came and revealed. Jesus came and communicated and uh, had a burden to share with us. And uh, according to this verse, actually, it tells us that the words that Jesus spoke were actually whose words? It's God's words. God spoke through His Son or in His Son. That's another way uh, to express it there. And uh, what did Jesus teach when it came to God? What did Jesus teach about God? Did Jesus teach that God was a trinity? And what did He reveal? And if not, what did He actually teach? This is what we want to explore. Uh, this is what we want to find out. Uh, he never really did, as we shall see. But before we go into it, I want to actually uh, define. We want to define exactly what we're talking about when we talk about uh, the Trinity. The definition for the Trinity that uh, Christians believe is summarized very well in this, uh, in this sentence here, that there is one God, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons. The three persons make up one God. The reason I want to define this, because a lot of people say, well, you know, th this trinity says this, but my trinity is different, and they define it in their own way, and so on. Uh, there is one standard classic definition of trinity. If you believe different, uh, you should not call it trinity, you should call it something else. Uh, the trinity simply and basically teaches that there is only one God who is made up of three persons. That it takes the three persons, the union of the three persons, to make up this one God. Now, if you think that's a little bit hard to understand, that's, that's, that's understandable because uh, it's admitted that that's a mystery and nobody can fully comprehend it, let alone explain it. But this is how it is defined. So this, the question or our quest is going to be very simple. Did Jesus reveal God to be such or not? And we want to explore it uh, particularly, as we said, in what Christ came uh, to reveal. Uh, we'll find, I'll tell you our findings before we actually go into it, just to... To, to lay it out as a premise, so to speak. We find that Jesus actually taught that God is made up of one person. He is one individual person, not actually more than that. Uh, one day Jesus was asked a question about the most important commandment, and Mark 12, 29 records the answer. It says, Jesus answered him, that's a scribe who asked him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And then he goes on to say that uh, loving him with all the heart and the mind is the most important thing. These are the first, uh, the, the first commandments, to know who God is and to love him. And of course, we must know God before we can love him. You can't just say, because usually when we ask the question, what's the first commandment? We say, oh, it's to love God. But you need to identify which God. There are many gods. And uh, God is not the same for every person. And so what Jesus did, he laid the foundation and says, look, you need to understand. The first of all of the commandments is the Lord our God is one. And it's this one God that you are to love with all the heart, soul, and mind, and strength. He was obviously quoting from the Old Testament. And the verse that he's quoting from the Old Testament is Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4, where Moses there says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, the Hebrew word for one here is the word echad. Uh, that's the Hebrew for one. You can look it up in the concordance and it will tell you it means uh, one. But some people have actually suggested that the word for one here actually means a unity. Not a solitary single one, but a unity. It's one unity that has more than one person in it. And uh, the, they use some, some creative reasons, but the, the go-to verse that is used uh, in conjunction with this, I think we all know it, is the story of the first marriage, Genesis 2.24. And this is uh, the verse that's quoted. It says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And the word one here is the same Hebrew word that is used in Deuteronomy uh, 6 and verse 4. Uh, the Lord our God is one Lord. The same Hebrew word. And so the reasoning is, uh, goes something like this. Adam and Eve were two people and they were said to be one. And so therefore, God is more than one person, but he is still one. God is actually three. Now there is, a, while at the surface it sounds like it's pretty convincing, there are some very inherent uh, big problems with this reasoning. We're going to explore just a few uh, because this is something that I'm often confronted with and, and I, I want to address it because a lot of people get confused over that. First of all, two does not equal three. Correct? If Adam and Eve are two individuals who are said to be one flesh, you can't use that to prove that God is three. If it proves anything, it must prove that it is two. But anyway, that's, that's not the case. So two doesn't uh, equal three. Uh, secondly, the word one here is actually defined. It's referring to something. It's referring to flesh. It says they are one flesh. It doesn't say that they are one individual or, or they, they have become one person, but that they are one flesh. So the oneness is actually defined, what it's being applied to. Now, the verse in Deuteronomy that we looked at doesn't... Uh, apply the oneness to something, it applies the oneness to 
the person himself. Okay, you see the difference here? And we're going to explore that a little bit better. Uh, in the New Testament, if we go to Matthew 19 and verse 5, notice what Jesus says here. It says, And said, For this cause shall a man leave, his father, uh, leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Again, Christ was quoting that. But I want to emphasize the point here where Jesus actually identifies that Adam and Eve were two, but they become one flesh. I want to compare the, these two verses. We'll put them in a table here and just uh, compare them. In Deuteronomy, it says that the Lord our God, it identifies who it's speaking about. It is the Lord our God. And then it says that the Lord our God is one. And the word Lord there is capital, of course. That's the proper name of God in Hebrew, Yahweh or Jehovah, what we understand to be Jehovah, uh, how it's transliterated in English. Uh, it identifies who is being spoken to and it identifies who is the one or what the one is referring to. When it comes to Adam and Eve, it actually says very plainly, it's Adam and Eve, they are two and they will be one flesh. So there's a very big difference. Adam and Eve being one flesh does not prove that God is three persons in one whatsoever even though the same Hebrew word is used. And so this is something important to keep in mind because, uh, like I said, a lot of people get caught up and, and even confused when it comes to this particular uh, verse. When we go to the New Testament, where Jesus quoted this verse uh, that we just read when he was speaking to the scribe, the word one in, in Greek is, is heis, which, or his, which is uh, the word for the numeral one. It doesn't mean more than it's, it's just one, like we would say in English. You know, this is uh, day one of the camp. Nobody would misunderstand that. It's the numeral one. And to illustrate that, there's a very handy verse that I think really brings the, the point out very clearly. Mark 12 and verse uh, 30, uh, sorry, Mark 6 and verse 24. Uh, it says here, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. And the word one here is the same one that Jesus used in Mark 12 where he says the Lord our God is one. Now I know I'm uh, uh, you know spending a little bit of time here to emphasize this point but this is foundational. You know once you understand what Jesus thought about this everything else falls in place and this is where a lot of people sadly get a bit confused because they start trying to redefine the word one. So the word one here I think it's quite obvious what it actually means. You can't serve two masters. You either love the one or hate the other. One here simply means one soul, solitary, whether thing or person. And this is what Christ was speaking uh, about when he was referring to the God of Israel. When Christ said that, he was referring to one individual, one particular person. <coughs> Adam and Eve are indeed two individuals who are one flesh. The one flesh is not a person. It's not an individual. It's not a being. It is uh, that they are united into one unit. They become one family unit made up of two persons. And we're told that. Nowhere in the scriptures has Jesus or anyone ever revealed that God is a union of multiple persons. That's an assumption that comes from somewhere else. And this is why when we go back to that discussion with the scribe, back in Mark 12 and verse 32, it says, And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth. For there is one God, and there is none other but He. So you can see here how the scribe, the scribe understood it. Uh, the word one that they were discussing was referring to one individual person. I, want you to, I don't want you to miss this point. Here are two individuals who speak the Hebrew language, the language in which the Old Testament was written. One of them is a scribe, an expert in the law. The other one happens to be the Son of God Himself. And the conversation that they're having happens to be about God and the importance of loving God. And the God that they identified in their conversation, based on the verses that were quoted from the Old Testament, is only one individual person, and there is none other but He. So, with all due respect, I don't, know how, I don't care how many degrees of theology you might have, I don't care how you try and redefine the Hebrew words, you cannot overcome the fact of who they are referring to in this conversation. It is one individual person and none other but he. 
because people go to all kinds of lengths to do all kinds of mental gymnastics, trying to redefine Hebrew words in ways that the Hebrews themselves don't see like uh, that way at all. And so this is why it's significant to keep that more, uh, point in mind. So the word had, the Hebrew word for one, means one and none other but he. Doesn't leave room to squeeze any more persons into that, does it? And uh, that's very, very clear from the teachings of Christ. Where did the scribe get this idea? Because Jesus approved of what the scribe said. If you read a little later, uh, a few verses later, Jesus actually tells the scribe, he, was, he finds that his answer is discreet or wise, and he tells him, you are not far from the kingdom. How did the scribe learn that there is one God and none other but he? Because, like I said, I've heard this a number of times and, and from different people and uh, different presenters, that the word echad there actually doesn't mean the solitary one and none other but he. If you actually go back to Deuteronomy, where that verse is quoted from, just a few chapters, not far from uh, Deuteronomy 6.4, just a few chapters earlier, notice what it says, Deuteronomy 4.35. Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, he is God, there is none else beside him. And so this is why when it comes to Deuteronomy 6.4, it says the Lord our God is one Lord. All the Hebrews listening, they would have understood, oh yeah, that's one and none other but he, and this is what the scribe was expressing. This is what was revealed in the Old Testament. This is what Christ came to reveal more clearly and confirm and affirm. So this is what Jesus had taught, that there is one God and none other but he. This is the God of the Jews, of the Hebrews. John 8, 54, Jesus says that. Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. He was referring to how many persons? One person. He says, the, the one that you say is your God, that's my father. I am his son. But you are refusing to acknowledge this fact. You're refusing to acknowledge me. That was the problem that they uh, experienced, that they had there. <clears throat> and in John 17, 3, this is a verse that's familiar to many of us. It says, uh, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. According to Christ, the only true God is his Father. He was praying to his Father at that time. Verse 1 tells us that. And eternal life is all about knowing the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Two individuals. One of them is the one God of the Bible. Christ happens to be the Son who was sent from heaven to reveal that for us. But some people might say, but look, you know, the, the one God actually includes Jesus as well. It's, it's, it's both. As a matter of fact, Jesus said it in John 10, 30. He says, I and my Father are one. There you go. I and my Father are one. That proves that Christ is part of what makes up God. You've heard that reasoning? I'm sure you have. That's a very common point. What did Jesus mean when he said, I and my Father are one? A lot of people take a lot of liberty with the words of Christ and define them and explain them in ways that Jesus didn't. When he says, I and my Father are one, he wasn't saying, we are one God. It doesn't say that. The verse actually stops there. I didn't cut it off. That's the end of the verse. The next verse says the rest, and we'll see that in a minute. But I and my Father are one. What is Christ referring to? It's actually a union or a oneness that is based on the relationship that they have together. And that relationship Jesus defined in that very same chapter, just a few verses later. Notice what he says in verse 36. It says, Say of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God. So here Christ is defining his relationship to his Father. He says, you know, you're, you're refusing what I'm saying, that my Father is that I am his son, that in saying that, you're saying I'm blaspheming because I said I am the son of God. Now, he actually said it in the, in the, in the verse, but sometimes because it's so common, it's missed. He says, I and my father are one. When he's saying my father, it automatically makes him the son, correct? So that's the relationship. He says, this relationship is defined as one. Well, what does that really mean? This oneness is based on the fact that Christ is the son of God. 
he defines it himself in the same chapter, just a few verses later. And this is something that's important to, to share with people who stop at verse 30 and say, see, I am my father, one that's the Trinity, one God, there you go. And, and sometimes they run off with that idea without actually reading the rest of the chapter. Verse 38 of the same chapter, he actually explains what he means. He says, but if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. This is how Christ is one with the Father. The Father was in him, dwelling in him, and Christ says, I in him, and I in the Father as well. Uh, does that remind you of any other passage where Christ spoke that way? It certainly does. Christ spoke that way to his disciples where he wished that they also might be one. We're going to come to that in a minute. But uh, it's important to allow Christ to explain what he means. They are one because the Father dwelt in in the Son. The Father spoke through the Son, as we read in Hebrews. They are not one God together, a union that makes one God, but they have a relationship. That relationship uh, is the basis for that oneness. That relationship is the Sonship of Christ. Because Christ was very clear as to how many persons make up God, we found earlier. And so he doesn't contradict himself. It's important to understand what he says when he defines it. <clears throat> uh, the verse I'm referring to is John 17. But before we go to John 17, I don't want to be misunderstood. Uh, the union of Christ with the Father, the relationship he has, being the Son of God, makes him a possessor of the very nature of his Father. In other words, he has the God nature. He is God by nature. He is fully and completely divine. He is deity. But that is because he is the Son of God. Just like our children have the same nature. Uh, we have. I just had a, uh, since our camp last year, our family unit has grown. My wife was pregnant when I was here last year, and she's given birth. So we have a little baby girl, and she happens to be a human being. Can you believe it? Now uh, that's, that's too obvious, I guess, but uh, you know that straight away because the parents are humans. She inherited our nature. Now God built that principle in humanity to teach us something so that when we hear about God revealing himself, that he has a son, it helps us understand and appreciate that the son has the very same nature as the father. And that's the basis of his uh, divinity. But in John 17, Jesus explains this oneness when he talks to the disciples. And this is where that reasoning uh, starts uh, to break down when we misunderstand the words of Christ. It says, verse 21, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. So the union between the Father and the Son, that oneness, is to be reflected in the disciples. We are all one. Now, does that mean we all become one human being? Does that mean we all become one individual? No, we're all individuals, but we have a union. We have a spirit that unites us together. In like manner, the Father and the Son do not become one God. They're actually two individuals. One of them is God. The other one is the Son of God, as Christ declared. So that oneness and that union is important to be understood in the way that Jesus himself <clears throat> explained it. Uh, here's another verse. This is an interesting verse where Jesus was speaking to the, to the Jews, the Pharisees and the, the unbelieving Jews. John 5:37 It says, And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. I'm not sure if you've given that verse much thought. I, I, I have recently, and it really made me think, what was Jesus talking about? Here he is talking to the Jews. He's saying, look, the Father, he bore witness of me. He testified of me. And you've never heard his voice or seen his shape. What was he referring to? When did the Father testify of the Son where there was a voice and there was a shape? Can you think of an incident? There's only one incident, really. It's the baptism. What Christ was referring to here was he was referring to the baptism and the witness that was borne by the Father by a voice 
And by a shape, he's saying, you, you didn't see, you didn't hear that. You weren't there. But he testified, he witnessed of me. As a matter of fact, the, uh, even if they were there, maybe they, didn't, they wouldn't have believed. Because I'm sure they would have heard the story. There were other, others there. But the word shape here is exactly the same word that's applied to the Holy Spirit in Luke 3.22. Referring, of course, to the baptism. It says, and the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in, in thee I am well pleased. Now this is a very interesting story because many times the story of the baptism is one of the proof stories that people like to go to to try and prove that God is a trinity. And the reasoning goes something like this. There is Jesus in the water and there is the Holy Spirit there in the shape of the dove between heaven and earth and the voice of the Father from heaven speaking. There you have it. Three, three in one God. You've heard that reasoning? I'm sure you've heard that reasoning. Now, the interesting thing here is, first of all, that, that's not how the verses uh, explain the presence of, uh, you know, the Father and the voice and, and the Holy Ghost and so on. Uh, but Christ credits the Father as being responsible for both the voice and the shape, correct? You with me? The shape wasn't someone else manifesting. Jesus said, you haven't seen, you, you, you haven't heard my father's voice, nor seen his shape. The shape was due to what the father did, and the voice was due to what the father did. One person in heaven who spoke with his own voice, and who also glorified his son on earth by sending down his spirit as glory and light in the shape of a dove. That was what was happening at the baptism. And this is what Jesus was referring to. <clears throat> Both voice and shape were the fathers as far as the person who uh, was responsible for them. You see, <clears throat> the spirit of the father was in the son. Jesus said it. The father is in me and I in him. The baptism was a visible manifestation and token of the father dwelling in the son. Light came down from heaven and abode upon Christ. And later on, John the Baptist says, God does not give his spirit by measure to his son. It was to demonstrate that this being here on earth is fully approved by heaven. The father spoke with a voice and gave a visible, physical demonstration that he is full of his spirit. And how Jesus defined that fullness of the spirit, he actually said, my father dwells in me not someone else. You with me? And so it's the Father who was responsible for both the voice and the shape. Well, that puts a very different slant on the story of the baptism all of a sudden, doesn't it? It doesn't prove a trinity far from it. It actually proves the fact that the Father dwells in the Son. How He does that is by His Spirit. <coughs> when it comes to uh, the Spirit, and that's of course how the Father and the Son are one which we just saw uh, a few minutes earlier. Uh, when it comes to the Spirit, people say, well, look, you know, that might be true. Fair enough. But when Jesus spoke about the Comforter and the coming of the Comforter, it was very clear that he was referring to another person. And that's the third person. That's the third member of the Trinity. And the verse that's usually quoted is John 14, verses 16 and 17. Jesus speaking, and I'll pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And usually people will say, well, there you go. It says there, another comforter. Not the same one. Another one. This is the Holy Spirit. is identified as the comforter. This is the Third person, Father, Son, and Spirit. There you go. There is the Trinity. This is, this is one of the most popular verses used to prove that the Spirit is a different person to the Father and the Son. I don't even need to ask you if you've heard that. Every, every person, this is one of the top go-to verses to prove that the Spirit is a different person. What did Jesus mean? Is this what he was teaching? Would he, at the end of his mission on earth, you know, with his disciples in the upper room, would he spring this new 
teaching on them that's inconsistent, the way it's interpreted by Trinitarians, that's inconsistent with everything else that he revealed, what does he actually mean? What is this or who is this other person? If we just keep reading, he explains it himself without the need to ask any theologian or anyone else. Christ himself explains it. Verse 18, he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Somehow, these words of Christ don't seem to have as much impact with some people as the words another comforter. A lot of people latch onto the words another comforter and it's like everything that Christ spoke about on the subject, but that's not the case. The same Jesus in the same conversation, in the same breath probably, actually said, when he said another comforter, he says, I will come to you. You know, one day Jesus was, uh, was asked by someone to come and, uh, <clears throat> and heal the daughter. I think she was sick or dead. And Jesus, uh, Jesus told them, I, I can't remember the story now, but Jesus, I remember the answer. Jesus says, I will come. You remember that? And what do you think the person understood when Jesus says, I will come? You think he understood that Jesus might send one of the disciples in his place? He understood that Christ himself would come. That's exactly what, will hap uh, what happened. Now, when Jesus, the same person, says the same words, why should we understand it differently? It's Jesus who actually says, I will come to you, to the disciples. Now, there is no question in their mind as to what they understood, who would be coming. And we're going to see that in a minute. But Jesus defines that this other comforter is none other than himself. But obviously, it will be in a different form because Christ did not return to his disciples in the flesh as a human being as he walked and talked with them on earth. He returned by his spirit and it was his spirit, not someone else's spirit. And the disciples were wondering about that. A few verses later, this is how one of the disciples uh, reacted. Judas, verse 22, Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world. I want you to notice something here. This is a question of how, not a question of who. Correct? That's what it says. It says, how are you going to do this? Judas, speaking on the behalf of all the disciples, actually understood who was coming. According to this verse, he understood that it was Jesus himself who was coming. We know that because he says, how is it that thou or you, in, in English that we use today, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not unto the world? They had no question as to who was coming. They knew it was the speaker, Jesus. The same one who had told them, I will send you another comforter, who a few words later told them, I will come to you. They understood what he meant. Their query was, Lord, how are you going to do that? How will you come so that we see you, but the world won't see you? Because Jesus was referring to him coming on a spiritual level to come and dwell in their hearts, in their minds, as he explains it himself. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. That's the coming of the Comforter. It's the presence of Christ in the soul. And because Christ has this relationship with the Father, He's the Son of God, and the Father dwells in Him, so when you have Christ, you also have the Father. And this is what Jesus exactly said. This is who the disciples understood the Spirit to be. It's the very presence of the Father and the Son in us. That's what the Holy Spirit is. That's what the Comforter is. That's what Christ taught. That's what the disciples believed. It's very strange that many disciples of Christ today believe something totally different to the disciples who heard the words of Jesus himself. And so indeed, at its most basic and foundational level, Christianity is misrepresented and misunderstood by Christians for the most part, alarmingly. Because the doctrine of the Trinity is, is the, the most common doctrine across the board as far as Christianity is concerned. As a matter of fact, not only is it the most important doctrine according to some, it is the testing doctrine that defines whether you're a Christian or not. In other words, if you happen to be a Christian and don't believe in the Trinity, you are not recognized as a legitimate Christian. You are classed as a heretic, perhaps. 
You realize that? It's, it's, it's actually, in, in the, it's, uh, I don't have the quotes here, but it's in writing. One of the ways to tell uh, you know, heretical Christians or uh, non-legitimate Christians is if they don't believe in the Trinity. So this is what you would be classed as by other Christians. Interestingly enough, the disciples believed that too, right? They did not believe in the Trinity. Jesus himself actually didn't. So it goes uh, to show you how much misconception and misapprehension exists about this most important aspect. Uh, <clears throat> when we say, well, you know, okay, that, that's fair enough. Someone might, might be honest enough in saying, okay, that's fair enough. But look, when Jesus was leaving, he told his disciples about the Trinity. Matthew 28, 19, he says, when you go baptize people, let's read the verse, see what it says. It says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. They say, see, Christ said it just before he left. There is the Trinity right there at the end of Matthew. And this is what we are to do. Baptize people in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure how people pull a Trinity out of that one, to be quite honest. The facts are, there is a Father. Jesus taught that his Father is the only true God. And he affirmed the words of the scribe that there is none other but he. There is a Son. Jesus is the Son of God. He told that very clearly. And there is most definitely a Holy Spirit. There is no question about that. Jesus told his disciples that that Spirit that would come is none other than he coming to abide in them. And in coming to abide with them, he would link them with the Father. And so it's the presence of the Father and the Son on a spiritual, invisible level. And when you are baptized, you are brought into union with the Father and the Son. And of course, the agency that unites you with the Father and the Son is none other than the Holy Spirit. Because it's something important to keep in mind. This verse does not say a lot of the conclusions a lot of people draw out of it. The word God is not even mentioned in this verse. It doesn't say these three are one God. It doesn't say these three are persons. It doesn't even define the relationship between them. But Jesus does previously in his teaching. So he's giving them this instruction based on what he had been teaching them all these years he was with them, those three and a half years. And so he can't all of a sudden now spring something on them that is to be taken to contradict everything he says. There's a beautiful verse in the epistle to the Ephesians that summarizes this very, very well. Ephesians 2.18. And here Paul says, For through him, that's Christ, referring to Christ in the context, for through him we both have access, that's uh, Jew and Gentile, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father, I want you to think about this verse for a minute. Through Christ, Paul says, we have access by one spirit unto the Father. Here the Father is mentioned, the Son is mentioned, and the Spirit is mentioned. Someone would say, hey, there you go, that, that, that's the Trinity. That's, that's not what Paul is saying. Paul is basically telling us there is only one link between us and Christ. Uh, uh, sorry, us and the Father. And that link is Christ. And how that is for us today is through that one spirit. You know, the Bible tells us there's only one mediator between God and man. Isn't that right? Jesus says, I am the way to the Father. No man comes to the Father except through me. He is the only way. There is no one else. And so when Paul says here, through him, through Christ, we have access by one spirit. That one spirit cannot be someone other than Christ because only Christ is the way to the Father. You with me? So to teach that the spirit is someone else is to teach that there is another way to the Father besides Christ, which goes contrary to everything Christ taught. So this one spirit is the means that Christ connects us to the Father. He dwells in us by his spirit and that gives us access to the Father. This is the meaning of the words that are written in this verse. And this helps us understand why Jesus said those words when it comes to baptism. And that's exactly what the disciples did and taught. They taught the same thing they heard from the lips of Christ. Because in the instruction in baptism, Jesus told his disciples, you know, you need to go to all nations and you need to teach them whatsoever things I have commanded you. Right? You're familiar with that verse? You need to teach them what I taught you. That's how you make disciples of them. And so the disciples taught this very truth. Acts 3.13 is a, is a very good verse 
that I like to go to because it is very clear. Which way are we going now? Here we go. Acts 3.13. Peter is speaking. Notice what he says. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus, whom he delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. According to Peter, who is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? It is one person who has a son whose name is Jesus. Correct? That's what he says. He says, the God of our fathers has glorified his son. So the God of the fathers is the one that has a son whose name is Jesus. I want you to stop and think about that for a minute. Because in this simple verse, Peter is of course, affirming the words of Christ and clearly identifying who the God of the Old Testament is. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. It is one individual, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's telling that to the Jews. He's saying, you're the ones who denied him in the presence of Pilate, but he, of course, uh, raised him up, and he was talking about the resurrection and so on. But uh, I don't think it's, it's uh, difficult to to conclude or to believe that the God of the Old Testament has to be the same God as the God of the New Testament, right? That's, it's, we worship the one God. God does, does not uh, change. And here is the interesting thing about that. Many people who believe in the Trinity, many uh, theologians who believe in the Trinity, are honest enough to admit that the Old Testament does not really reveal a Trinity. You've heard that? They say, look, it's not clear in the Old Testament. It's, it's, and they, they say things like there are hints and there are suggestions and, and you know, little things that, that now we believe in the Trinity. We can see it in the Old Testament. But the Old Testament does not teach it. The easiest proof of that is the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation never believed in the Trinity. In other words, Abraham did not understand or believe that God is a Trinity. Isaac, Jacob, all the fathers, none of them understood or believed that God is a trinity. They understood and believed that God is one person. One person. I have to define that because people hear one and they still fit more than one into that one. So I have to be clear in, in what I'm referring to. One person. Now it would be an alarming, alarming thing for all those people who died in the faith and then God would come in the New Testament and this is what a lot of Trinitarians admit. They say, well, you know, the Trinity is, is a revelation that the New Testament gives us. It's a clear revelation. We don't really see it clearly in the Old, Old Testament. And I don't know if, if they realize what they're saying. In other words, they're saying the God that we worship today is a different God to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. That, brothers and sisters, is a disaster. That is an absolute disaster. Either they had a wrong concept of God, Good luck trying to convince people of that. Or we have a wrong concept of God as Christians believing in the Trinity. Peter here is very, very clear that the God of the fathers is one person. It's consistent with what Jesus taught. It's what the Old Testament has revealed. New truth does not contradict previous truth. That's what people say, you know, there is a new revelation. God now revealed himself in a new way. Well, he can't contradict how he revealed himself in the past. So very important point. To keep that in mind. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6. Speaking of the Spirit. It says, And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The Spirit of Jesus is in the heart. In other words, Jesus Himself is that Spirit. That's what the Scriptures indicate. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 17 says that. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And where the Spirit of the Lord desires to be more than anywhere else is in the heart of man. Where there is bondage so that he can bring liberty. Only Jesus can do that. The Lord is that Spirit. And then here is this interesting and beautiful verse, 1 Corinthians 6, 17. When we receive the Spirit, when we're joined to the Lord, the Bible says... But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Because that's how the Father and the Son are united. The Father is in the Son. 
The son says, the father is in me and I in him. And then he says, that's the union he wants to have us share, and that's the union he wants to have with us individually. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. That's what Christianity is about. That's why the devil has a deception about this most basic fundamental point. That when you have the spirit, you don't have Jesus, you have someone else, another person. Doesn't matter what name you might give him, it's someone other than Christ. That is a very big problem. The word spirit in the scripture means life. I'm not going to go into all the details, but Jesus said it. You know, he says, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. This is what's re what it's referring to. When we become one spirit with the Lord, people say, what does that mean? You know, it's we become one life. Just like, you know, our baby that was born, she received life. The life that her father and mother, we have, that she, a part of that life is hers. And we receive that from our parents. We go all the way back to Adam. On a spiritual level, when we are joined to the Lord Jesus, we receive his life. It is called the spirit. That's how we are made one with him. We are one spirit with him. And that's how we are united with God. Now, this is as far as the teachings of Christ is concerned. There is a Another interesting aspect, I just want to spend a little bit of time with that. I'll try and go as quick as I can. But there's a, a beautiful book written about the life of Christ. It's probably the most uh, well-known book about the life of Christ. Anyone knows what book I'm referring to? It's called The Desire of Ages. Do I need to ask how many people read it? I am curious. How many have read The Desire of Ages here? Okay, most hands went up. Fantastic book about the life of Christ, one of the most beautiful uh, books. And... Sadly, this book is also uh, blamed or used by some people uh, to try and say, well, in that book, the teaching of the Trinity exists. I'm going to examine this claim a little bit. I want to show you the claim first uh, because uh, we want to explore this a little bit. Seeing we're looking at the teachings of Jesus, it makes sense to look at, you know, this most popular and well-loved book about the life of Christ. What does that say? Obviously, it can't say different to what Christ told in the scriptures, but I want to explore it because a lot of people honestly think that this book made a change, particularly in our beliefs as Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, this is a book, this is another book now, <laughs> it's called uh, The Trinity, Understanding God's Love, uh, written by three authors uh, from Andrews, Andrews University. And in this book, there is this interesting quote. It says, I'm going to have to read it off here. Uh, Nevertheless, the publication of Ellen White's The Desire of Ages in 1898 became the continental divide for the Adventist understanding of the Trinity. And this is referred to as a paradigm shift, where basically what they're saying is the book Desire of Ages marks the dividing point that shifted the church to the Trinity. Before that time, it is admitted reluctantly by some that the church did not believe in the Trinity. But because of the desire of ages, a change has come about. A change is so drastic and dramatic, it's a paradigm shift. And uh, what it boils down to, you think, wow, the desire of ages, okay, where can I go to find that? What it boils down to is basically two statements in the, the book Desire of Ages that are used to support this claim. I want to explore those two statements, and then we want to look at what the desire of ages actually says in other places to help us understand what these statements mean, what is actually taught in that book. The two key statements, the first one is this one from page 530. I think we all know that one. It's not that long. In Christ's life, original, unborrowed, underived. And people say, see, there you go. This statement demonstrates and proves that Christ is not truly the begotten Son of God. It's not what they say, but this is the conclusion that they are aiming at. Christ is God in and of himself, independently of the Father. He is a possessor of life, original, unborn, underived, just like the Father. He did not receive that from the Father. It is his own, all by himself. What is that what, the, what that really means? Uh, rather than me trying to tell you stuff, I'll let the author of these words explain it in her own words from the context of where that statement comes from. Uh, 
we'll read it in context. Here's what it says, referring to Christ. It says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. It is not physical life that is here specified, but immortality, the life which is exclusively the property of God. The Word who was with God and who was God had this life. Physical life is something which each individual receives. It is not eternal or immortal, for God, the life giver, takes it again. Man has no control over his life, but the life of Christ was unborrowed. No one can take this life from him. And it continues, I lay down of myself. He said, in him was life, original, unborrowed, underived. This life is not inherent in man. He can possess it only through Christ. He cannot earn it. It is given him as a free gift if he will believe in Christ as his personal savior. Did you catch that? It says original, unborrowed, underived life, which is the exclusive property of God, was in Christ. And this life can be our life. And we can possess this life and it can be given to us if we believe in Christ, correct? In other words, we can also have life original, unborrowed, and underived. And that does not make us members in a trinity. That does not mean that we are God just because we have that life. So Christ actually bestows that life. In other words, if you think about it this way, According to what we just read, original, unborrowed, underived life can be given, according to Ellen White, the author of these words, can be given. We can have it. So I guess then the question is this. Well, was Christ given that life? Where did that life come from? Well, Desire of Ages will tell us. Uh, how many things did Christ receive from his Father? Desire of Ages, page 21. All things Christ received from God, but he took to give. Well, does all things include life as well? The, the same quote continues. Well, that's the question. Does, does that include life? Same quote, page 21, Zara of Ages. So in the heavenly courts, in his ministry for all created beings, through the beloved Son, the Father's life flows out to all. So what kind of life is the Father's life? It's an original, unborrowed, underived life. It was given to the sun. It flows through the sun. That's why the sun has life, original, unborrowed, and underived. It's the Father's life. And we can possess them. Then it goes on. Through the sun it returns in praise and joyous service to the, a tide of love to the great source of all. And thus through Christ the circuit of beneficence is complete, representing the character of the great giver, the law of life. The Father is the great source of all. And this is what that statement means when we use the same book written by the same author to explain it. It's not that hard. The next statement is a, is a favorite. This is the other statement that is used from the same book. And this is a very often used, page 671. I think we all know it. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead who would come with no modified energy but in the fullness of divine power. And there, of course, it's referring to the Holy Spirit and people say, see, there you go. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. That's it. The Trinity. And in, and in reading that statement in this way, I'm coming to a Trinitarian conclusion. It's like people don't, they discount what that would mean when it contradicts everything else in the same book, as we shall see, and everything that Christ taught. What does this mean? Sin can only be resisted by this mighty agency, the third person of the Godhead. Again, using the book, The Desire of Ages Only, it explains to us what is being meant here. Now, I want you to keep in mind that it says this is the only way that sin can be resisted through this agency called the third person of the Godhead, also known as the Holy Spirit. The only way to resist sin. Notice what is the only way to resist sin according to the same book. Page 324. The only defense against evil is the indwelling of Christ in the heart through faith in his righteousness. So according to the same author, this agency called the third person of the Godhead, known as the Holy Spirit, is also known as the indwelling of 
Christ. Now, this is not my opinion. This is not my take on, this is not my explanation of the passage. This is the same author explaining to you and me what she means in the same book. But this quote doesn't get used as often. And so it's like, well, it's not as important. No, it is. It explains what is being meant. Here's another one. Without the life of Christ in us, we cannot withstand the storms of temptation. Zara of Ages 599. Remember, sin can only be resisted and overcome by this agency called the third person of the Godhead. The only defense against evil is the indwelling of Christ. Without the life of Christ, we can't withstand the storms of temptation. That's saying exactly the same thing in different words. All these things are talking about the same thing. The indwelling of Christ is the life of Christ, is the third person of the Godhead, is this agency through which we can resist and overcome sin, according to the author. And so what are we saying? We're saying, you know, this spirit is, is, is the life of Christ? Of course. That's what Jesus taught in the Gospels. And this is what the same book tells us. Zara of Ages 8.05. The impartation of the spirit is the impartation of the life of Christ. Can't really get much clearer than that. And the term that the author uses, among others, in this book to represent that or to refer to that, she calls it the third person of the Godhead. It's the personal presence of Christ, not physically as a person with us in the flesh, but in spirit, in the heart. And so that's why having him is having the life of Christ. That's what she means when she says third person. And it's important too. It's important to allow the author to explain and define the terms that they use. It's very clearly done in this book. Uh, and so this, this is another reason to really love this book. You, know? you, can, you can use the Zara of Ages alone to, to share the truth about God. It's very clearly stated there. And so that claim that is made that uh, the Zara of Ages changed things and introduced the Trinity into the church is more of a wishful thinking, really. It's not true. It's, uh, we don't know the motives of those who make the claim, but it's a lie. It's not true. It just doesn't stack up with the evidence that we have available. There are many other beautiful statements in the same book that don't seem to get attention. I'll read a few, and we'll use those to close, because our time is basically up. But here is one from page 166. While Jesus ministers in the sanctuary above, he is still by his spirit the minister of the church on earth. He is withdrawn from the eye of sense, but his parting promise is fulfilled. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. While he delegates his power to inferior ministers, his energizing presence is still with his church. Christ is the minister of the church on earth, not someone else. Christ didn't leave and put someone else in charge and say, you run things down here while I go to heaven to be the high priest. Christ, even though he's in heaven, he is still the minister of the church on earth. He does that by his spirit. Uh, Zara of Ages, page 22. From the beginning, God and Christ knew of the apostasy of Satan and of the fall of man through the deceptive power of the apostate. How many knew? Two. The Father and the Son. Satan happened to be the third person who, who held the third highest position in heaven after the Father and the Son. When it comes to ranking, if you want to put it that way, the Father is the great source of all. Elsewhere we're told Christ is next in authority. And then we're told, elsewhere as well, that Satan is, was next in authority. This is before his fall. Okay, Lucifer. I just want to clarify. Lucifer, before his fall, was next to Christ in authority, in power, in perfection, so on and so forth. And then when he fell, someone else replaced him. You know who replaced him? The angel Gabriel. The same book tells us that. I don't have those quotes up here today. But uh, it's interesting to look at everything that the Spirit of Prophecy tells us. So the Father and the Son, they knew of the apostasy of Satan. Here it is, page 25, another statement. These are the statements people don't usually quote. That's why I, I want to focus on them, show you what it actually says. To assure us of his immutable counsel of peace, God gave his only begotten son to become one of the human family forever to retain his human nature. God gave his only begotten son. That's the son that he had all the way back there from the beginning. 
who with him knew of this apostasy of Satan, and they together planned this plan of salvation. Uh, you know, and, and people say, yeah, well, only begotten is just a term, using the Bible term, it just means unique. Well, it doesn't mean just unique. It actually means he is a born son. Same book, page 51. Here it is. The dedication of the firstborn had its origin in the earliest times. God had promised to give the firstborn of heaven to save the sinner. Okay, here it is again, using synonymous terms. God gave his only begotten son, the firstborn of heaven. That's why God had the, his people on earth, they would give, they would uh, dedicate their firstborn child. Why, why the firstborn? What's so special about the firstborn? Because the firstborn of heaven was the one who was going to be a savior. That's the only begotten son of God. Firstborn of heaven. That doesn't get much publicity, that quote. So we're publicizing it here today a little bit Amen. from the same book. Uh, here is another one. This talks about creation. In the beginning, the Father and the Son had rested upon the Sabbath after their work of creation. When the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them, the Creator and all heavenly beings rejoiced in contemplation of the glorious scene. That first Sabbath, how many rested? The Father and the Son. God the Father created all things by Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us. The work of creation is, is the work of two beings, the Father and the Son, not three. Never three, you'll never find that. That's from Desire of Ages, page 769, we just read that. And here is uh, our last one. As it was in the beginning, so it will be in the end. Desire of Ages, page 770. Heaven and earth will unite in praise as from one Sabbath to another the nations of the saved shall bow in joyful worship to God and the Lamb. That's what happened in the beginning. Father and Son created and they rested on the Sabbath. And in the end, all the saved in the kingdom of heaven will come from one Sabbath to another to worship who? God and the Lamb. And so it would only make sense that in the interim, all the Sabbaths we spend here on earth, we should worship the same beings that we would worship in heaven, right? It says here only two, Father and Son. One of them is the only true God. And the other one is His only begotten and dearly beloved Son. So the book, The Desire of Ages, is a beautiful book. I love it when people say, oh, you know what The Desire of Ages says. We say, oh, okay, well, let's look at what The Desire of Ages says. And it's a powerful uh, witness to the truth about God. And so, when we look at this doctrine of the Trinity that we defined earlier, that there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons, we find that Jesus never taught this strange doctrine. And I say strange because it does not exist in all of the scriptures, not just in the teachings of Christ. Because the, the, all the scriptures is really the inspiration of Christ. But particularly when Christ was on earth, this is where we focused on, we find he did not teach this. As a matter of fact, his teaching was decidedly contrary to this concept. Completely opposite to it. And the book Desire of Ages, probably the favorite book on the life of Christ among Adventists definitely does not teach this idea whatsoever. We examined that. There's a lot more that could be said about that book and more quotes, but we examined, I think, enough to make that particular point and explain what the author meant by these things. You see, Jesus' teachings, brothers and sisters, were very practical. They were not theoretical. Jesus didn't come teach us uh, philosophical concepts about God, concepts that, that even theologians today admit the Trinity does not make sense or doesn't make enough sense for us to understand it. It is beyond us. It is a mystery that we can't fully explain. This always boggles my mind. How can you admit that it cannot be explained and yet have a definite definition for it? That if people don't agree with, you class them as non-Christians. I honestly don't know how that makes sense. If you're admitting that you can't explain it and it's a mystery, then in other words, you're saying you don't know what you're talking about. And you're still talking about it. You know, that's, that's not very smart, right? Now, I'm not trying to make fun of people. I'm just examining the claims that are made. The claims in and of themselves are self-contradictory. We need to really listen to what is being said. We need to examine that. And so the Father, Jesus, when he taught things about God, it wasn't just theory and, and philosophy. The Father was a real Father who had a real Son. 
He has a real love for us, and he sent his only begotten son. There's no need to overcomplicate that and turn it into something incomprehensible. God loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. It really means what it says. It's not rocket science. There's no need to redefine those words. And having eternal life is to believe on that son. If you have the son, you will have eternal life. You will come into union and fellowship with the father and with the son. So I appeal to you that we should be Christians who follow the example and the teachings of Jesus when it comes to who God is, because that affects who we worship and how we relate to this God. So in closing, I want to make uh, this challenge, this appeal, and make this uh, claim as well, that the Trinity doctrine is actually incompatible with Christianity. Amen. If you realize that, it's not found in the teachings of Jesus whatsoever. It's totally foreign. It is incompatible. It, is not, it has nothing to do with Christianity. And I know it's a bit of an out there claim, but I'm making it hopefully after we've seen together what Jesus has taught and what the scripture has to say about that. How can we be Christian and believe something Jesus never advocated but thought the very opposite of? That's the thing to really think about. Let's have a word of prayer to close.